All right. Where do I want to start? Let's start here. I'm going to give you a list of names. And I want you to tell me one thing they all had in common that is not. They were in the Bible. Okay. That they all have that in common. And not that they were in a particular set of scriptures because they have that in common. I want you to tell me what each of these people had in common. Okay. So first, Adam and Eve. You can write these down because there are several. Adam and Eve. It's like a pop quiz, isn't it? All of this, this entire group, what do they have in common? Okay. Next is Isaac and Rebecca. After that, we have Jacob and Rachel, Leah, Bill, and Zilpah. <laughs> that whole group. <laughs> Rachel and Leah, Bilha and Zilpah. Don't worry, I'm not going to correct your spelling. Eli. Samuel, David, Solomon. I'll just run through that list real quick once more. We have Adam and Eve, <coughs> Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah, Eli. Samuel, David, and Solomon. I'll give you a minute to let that percolate in your brain, see if you can find the common thread. No, it's not that they're all Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Write your answer down just briefly because we're going to correct your, 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 your answer. I'm doing what a professor in college did to us. He would ask a question that would have several correct answers, but you had to give him the one he wanted. <laughs> okay, Because there's probably a lot of things in here that they share in common, or at least some would share with most. Um, we are dealing with the family. We have spent several weeks uh, talking about husband and wife, how they were created, why they were created, uh, what sin did when it came in, uh, how that played out from Genesis to today, uh, what scripture has to tell husbands as to how they're to treat their wives, and what scripture has for wives as to how they treat their husbands. Um, so what is the second relationship dynamic according to Genesis? Family relationship, okay? Now, I'm assuming, okay, God and man, yeah, that's first, that goes without saying, but in the, the family that has been given to us, the first relationship is Adam and Eve. What is the second? Children. Yeah, Cain and Abel. Now, see if this will give you any clue as to what the corollary is. Um, Cain kills Abel. Esau 
gives up his birthright to his brother Jacob, who then steals Esau's blessing. The 12 sons of Jacob, and we can go on and on with, with his, his son's behavior. Eli and his sons. Samuel and his sons. David, Amnon, Tamar, Absalom, Adonijah, and Solomon with Rehoboam. Do you see a connection flowing through here? See, we see uh, the family dynamic at work. We have, see, uh, um, there's two things that I want to say before we get, get really into this. First, nothing that I say here have I attained. Okay. As a father, I am not setting the mark, be like me, other than to say, be like me and learn, okay? because I have not attained what scripture says. Okay. The, the, the second thing is, I am talking about the family dynamic as intended by God, not in, as a biological uh, construct between a properly functioning male and a properly functioning female. Okay? Biologically, yeah, that's father and mother, but, but God has something very different in mind um, than just biology. Okay? Um, we know this because um, in the New Testament, uh, he has given us to call him what? Father. Father and what? Abba, which is a, a an intimate term of relationship for a father and a son. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's take a look at a couple of these things here. Uh, Genesis chapter four. Flip there with me if you would, real quick. One of the things that, uh, if you haven't seen by this point, I want to point out to you, is that when sin enters in, things go downhill very quickly. Okay, I mean like really fast. Um, we talked about Adam and Eve in the garden and the serpent and the persimmon, whatever the fruit was, um, and how quickly the dynamic changed between what God had intended and what was, okay? So now we're, we're starting, I'm just gonna pick up in verse one. Uh, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. You get the picture here, right? Oh, the farmer and the cowman should be friends. <laughs> right? Well, except he's a sheep man. Um, I don't know <coughs> what the offerings were other than what it says here. I don't know what fruit of the ground uh, Cain brought. I, no. Uh, we also, it's not given to us to know what the attitude was under which they brought it. Okay? 
But what we do know is that Abel brought the best of what he had. It doesn't say that about Cain. You look at what it says. It says, uh, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel, however, brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Okay. Abel brought the best that he had. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the widow's mites. You know, Jesus was sitting in the temple and he was watching these people bring their offerings and, and from the things that uh, we can gather from scripture, evidently for some people it was quite a procession uh, as they brought their gifts. And he watched as the, the widow came and she put in her two copper coins. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, uh, surely this woman has given more than all the rest because they have given out of their excess but she has given all that she had to live on. Okay. Uh, you, you're, you're never going to impress God with the amount that you give. Okay. It, it's a heart issue. Okay. Um, what does scripture say that, that uh, God wants? God loves a, a cheerful giver. Um, I personally, and, and this, this is not scripture, this is my opinion. Okay, I personally, I, I think Cain had an attitude problem. I think probably Adam was poking around one day and he said, hey, oh, by the way, you guys should probably bring an offering to God and, and work on that relationship and, and keep things good. And Cain was like, oh, crud. Man. All right, well, these are the things that I want and this is what's left. So here, God, you can have it. Okay. Now, I, I, Scripture doesn't say that. That's just what I think. I think by what it says here, it's pretty clear that Cain did not bring the best and Abel did. Okay. But if you look at this, uh, Cain was very angry and his face fell. Who was Cain angry with? He's ticked at God. Okay. And I think he's angry because God revealed his heart. Okay. Uh, so verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Okay. There's a word of warning given there, and, and quite honestly, I think it's a warning that we should be very aware of today. Um, Peter puts it like this, that, that uh, there's a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. Okay? We've got to be on our guard. One of the things that never ceases to amaze me is when two people are in contention over an issue, uh, the actual issue tends to be very minor but it's the feelings that have, have blown it all out of proportion. Um, Christy and I are learning to deal with the issue that is causing a problem without taking it beyond what the issue is. Okay. So, the Lord says to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? Um, if you do well, Will you not be accepted? That's part of why I think he didn't bring his best. You know, um, you also got to think about this. Uh, we have no idea what the offering situation was at this point. Up to this point, there had only ever been one offering made, and that was God on behalf of man, because God slew the animals and took their skin and gave it to Adam and Eve for a covering. So the only sacrifice up to this point that we know of is something God did. Okay? So um, we see as God is speaking to Cain, uh, he, he's making clear, hey, look, you can fix this. this. I have not cast you out. Come with the right attitude. Okay? But if you don't, sin is crouching at your door. 
I've, I've shared with you before about the Van Note temper. Um, most of the male Van Notes in, in our family have it. Several of the, the Van Note women have it. And several of the women that were not Van Notes and married into it learned it. <laughs> um, uh, James chapter 1. James is speaking to the church, and he says, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Okay? This, this is one of those life verses that God has branded in my brain, because uh, there are times when anger is appropriate. There is never a time when our anger we should sin. Okay. Um, getting angry is, is a, a hormonal flash going through your body. A lot of times, I, I remember distinctly being a teenager, and uh, you know, I, I didn't get the talk about hormones changing other than how that re was going to reflect with girls. I didn't get the fact that you know, sometimes you're just going to be cranky because you're cranky. Okay. Um, I remember I was sitting in the living room and my mom came in, and for no reason whatsoever, I was mad. I said, where have you been? She said, I had to go to the grocery store. I got your insulin. Well, that, that just irked me because, you know, my siblings got donuts and I got insolent. <laughs> okay. uh, but for no reason I was angry. And, and I remember that. Uh, you know, we talk about it getting up on the wrong side of the bed. Um, I, I'm not sure there is a right side of the bed for some people. Okay? Um, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. Okay? There's our warning. And here's what should be our reaction. You must rule over it. Okay? We have to choose not to let it affect us. And that's one of those things that uh, is called maturity. Because sometimes, doesn't it feel good to just let loose and vomit your anger, frustration, weariness, whatever, all over the room. And then, you know, then we gotta go through the process of cleaning everything up. And, uh, you know, I, I read the story of the child that had a, a very bad temper. And his dad told him that for every time he lost his temper, he needed to put a nail in their wooden fence. And, you know, the first day he put like 15 nails in the fence. Over the course of time, as he learned to control his temper, his father told him, every time that you control your temper, I want you to go and I want you to pull a nail out of the fence. Okay. You know, over the course of time, as he, he grew and he matured, he went and he pulled, he ended up pulling all of the nails out of the fence. Now, we could leave it right there and that could be a, a cool story, but that's not where the father left it because when the last nail came out, he went out and he talked to his son and he showed him the fence because the fence was no longer the same. The fence was riddled with holes. And he told his son, see, that's what anger does. You might go back and remove the bar, but you've left damage, okay? And as believers, we are called to something more than just the, the, uh, the flesh. Galatians chapter five lists all kinds of sin that every one of us is susceptible to. But it tells us that we are to uh, not live by the flesh, but we are to live by the spirit. That's the process of maturity. So as a warning, I say to you right now, beware, because sin is crouching at your door. Okay? But you can rule over it. God has put it in us with his spirit to not have to sin. We can choose to not. Okay? So then let's get back to our, our, our uh, history here. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, 
And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop there. There's more that comes on as a story, but I want to just, just draw out a couple things here real quick. Um, Todd and I are very close in age. Um, he's 15 months older than I am. And, you know, as, as uh, the hormonal changes came at puberty, we were very close together with that happening. And uh, Todd was always more of a physical person. Uh, he loved working with wood and, and building and, and things like that. I was, I was much more of an egghead. I, I like to read. I like to know. And, uh, but Todd and I, uh, we, we got into a lot of spats. I told you about the, the knives we received for Christmas and then had them taken away before New Year. Um, we have, uh, I, I thank God that none of my children turned out like me and my brother. I really do. Um, although, as they get older and further away from me, I'm finding out that things weren't quite as tranquil as I thought they were. Um, Todd and I got into it one day after school. I don't know what it was. It was probably because I was alive and in the room. I don't know. But I would egg, I would egg him on. Okay. And he finally had enough, enough one. Todd, uh, when his, he had enough, he would always say, you want to step outside? Because that's, we weren't allowed to fight inside. Um, I, I don't really know where that came from because we weren't allowed to, but we did. Um, and I said, sure. And we walked over and I opened the door and he walked out. I shut the door and locked. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, he's more physical. I'm, I'm more physical. <laughs> okay, now, you laugh. But my dad was not laughing when he arrived home and found out that Todd had kicked the door in. <laughs> okay? So, uh, I could relate to Cain and Abel. Because if Todd and I had done something and, and my mom or dad said I did a good job and he should watch for sin crouching at his door, I wouldn't be going anywhere with Cain. I wouldn't go anywhere with Todd. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So, whose fault is this? Cain's? Well, I mean, we have no understanding as to how Adam and Eve raised him. Um, I mean, you, you think about a difficult job. It's a difficult job for us when our firstborn is born. And we have all kinds of people around us that have gone through that. Adam and Eve weren't born. How is this supposed to work? What, what are the guidelines here? I mean, talk about taking a, a stab in the dark. The very first children. Murder. Nah, you know, that's, that's heavy stuff. They didn't, they didn't just, you know, slip a dirty word out in a moment of frustration. This was the taking of a life, something that had not been done before. Okay? Now, uh, one other thing I want to draw here real quick. Where's your brother? Did God not know? And this is, this is a, almost the exact same thing as in chapter 3 when he comes to the garden. He said, where are you? God knew exactly where they were. He wanted them to come to him. Okay? It's the same today. God will move and move and move and move, but unless you turn and take that step, okay? 
So when God asks Cain, which, what I find really cool is that God is talking to Cain. You know? God still approaches him. Okay? And, and oh, am I my brother's keeper? And I can, I, can, I can see that snarky attitude because that's what I had to my mom when she walked in the door that day. As if I knew anything, you know, really? And uh, so am I my brother's keeper? And then we, we see the remainder of this story. God speaks to him how his very creation is crying out, how, how his creation is now changed because of what has happened. So first thing that I want you to know, Adam and Eve, I don't know. I don't know whether Adam and Eve, you know, didn't, we, they didn't have the Ten Commandments at this point, so they couldn't point to, you know, number six and say, you shall not murder. I mean, what, what rules did they have posted around their house? We don't know. I mean, did they even tell them that, you know, killing your brother's not a good thing? We have no clue. I don't know if, if the blame for this is, is in the upbringing, nurture, or nature. Quite honestly, I think it's some of both. Uh, if you look on the front of your bulletin, uh, there's a, a quote from uh, Proverbs, I think it's chapter 22. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Solomon writes, uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, there's two things that I want to say about that. First, um, when Solomon wrote the Proverbs, he was writing wisdom. He's writing, what I see most is if you do this, this happens. Okay? Uh, does anybody remember that old, I think it was a country song, uh, something to the effect, um, you don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. Yeah, you don't pull the mask off the old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, this passage in Proverbs, I don't think is saying that if you do a good job raising your kids, they're going to turn out all right. Uh, and I say that for two reasons. One, because when Solomon is writing, he's writing observations. This is what I see happening. If you tug on Superman's cape, this is what's going to happen. Okay? And the, the second reason that I, I don't think this is a promise is because this doesn't always work. Okay? Because there's this nasty thing called will, and, and we all have it, and when a child determines to do something, um, I, I was not involved, I was not asked, uh, I was not queried beforehand. If so, I would have told Donovan that throwing the chair at your brother is not a good idea. Um, in that moment, I don't think, uh, well obviously Christopher wasn't thinking because he shot him with an um, airsoft gun, which, by the way, the name is a lie. There's nothing soft about it. Okay. Uh, Christopher being funny, he... Poor Benj. He took Benjamin's airsoft gun. Donovan was messing over, I don't know, at a video game or something, and Christopher's going to shoot him in the rear end. And just as Christopher shot, Donovan squatted down, and he got pegged in the back of the head. Okay, now, uh, at some point in the ongoing negotiations there, uh, Donovan heaved a chair at Christopher. I don't know if it hit him and bounced or if he just missed, but a couple of days later I came downstairs and there was a hole in the sheep rock. Hey, sweetie, do you know anything about this? Nope. Family meeting. <laughs> uh, what happened? 
Oh, it's okay, Dad. We got it all worked out. <laughs> That's not what I asked. What happened? Well, you know, airsoft, gun, stupid people, chairs. <laughs> but we're okay now. I said, you guys might very well be okay now. But my wall isn't. <laughs> you put a hole in my wall. Guess what? You guys get to fix it. And I took away Benjamin's airsoft gun. <laughs> Which, by the way, Kathy, your children gave him. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> I'm just glad that they moved out before they bought real guns. Okay? So, um, there's will. Okay. Sometimes, your children, regardless of how well you brought them up, will do really horrible things, okay? Um, I find it interesting that when Paul lays out the list for elder and, and deacon, he says that uh, uh, their household must be in order, okay? Now, what's interesting about that is um, in the Hebrew culture at 12 years old, the son became a man. <clears throat> Okay, the bar mitzvah, and I think the Jews were incredibly smart in how they did this because it's right about 12 years old that the hormones start kicking in and they get stupid. Okay? Um, if there is a, an elder or a deacon and they have a grown child that is not serving the Lord, does that disqualify them for being an elder or a deacon? I don't think it does because at that point, their grown child is their own household. Okay. Now, if there are things going on in the house, um, I think that needs to be addressed. All right, but there comes a point when uh, you're you're no longer under mom and dad's covering, and you have to step out into God's covering, and and make your own choices. Okay. So this is why I believe that uh, uh, that passage is not a promise; it's an observation. Okay, because people choose sometimes foolishly. All right. Now, I want to turn that just briefly. By all means, pray for them. Don't give up praying for them. Stand fast, even when it looks like there is no hope. These three things abide. Faith, hope, and love. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, I don't know if Adam and Eve messed up and not laying down that this would be a bad thing to do. Uh, honestly, it probably never crossed their minds. It wasn't until my kids were older that it crossed my mind to tell them, yeah, don't kill each other. <laughs> okay? Uh, so, I believe part of it uh, was his nature. Uh, and, and some of it may have been as nurture, I don't know, but scripture doesn't indicate for us. So let's go forward real quick. Uh, I'm just going to hit these a uh, couple real fast. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca. Now this one, I think there's blame to go all around. Esau was born first. And uh, there was a word given that the older would serve the younger. Now, I, I, I don't... This was probably very much like Todd and I. Todd would have been Esau because he, he liked going out and doing things. He was very physical. Um, I was uh, much more content um, to kind of avoid whatever he was doing. Um, but Isaac, Esau was his boy. Esau was a daddy's boy. Jacob, mama's boy. Okay. Um, Esau, of his own volition, gives up his birthright. Uh, does anybody know what that means, birthright? When we say a birthright, what does that mean? Anybody? Yeah. Um, in, the, in the Torah, um, it says that uh, the firstborn is the strength of the man, and he is to receive a double portion of the inheritance. As a matter of fact, it goes through and says that... Uh, if a man 
marries a woman and uh, then marries a second woman and, and he doesn't love the first but does love the second uh, and you see kind of where this is coming from with this whole Rachel and Leah thing. Um, if the child that is born first is from the unloved woman, he is still obligated to give that son the double portion, the birthright blessing. Okay. Now, I don't know how the Jews were thinking at this time. Well, technically they weren't Jews yet, but the, I don't know what was going through Jacob's mind. Um, I don't know how that would have worked out. Oh yeah, Dad, by the way, um, you know, I got Esau's birthright, so you know, pony up. I don't know. It doesn't say how Jacob reacted. It doesn't say uh, how Rebecca reacted. But, but Esau gave up his, his birthright for a bowl of stew. I haven't seen a bowl of stew good enough. <laughs> you know. Um, but then later, <laughs> Isaac's getting old, and he calls Esau in, and he goes and says, hey, I, I want you to go and get me fresh game and, and prepare for me the food that I like so I can give you your blessing. Now, I, I don't know how it worked back then, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Rebecca was in the room, or at least close enough she could hear what was going on, because as soon as Esau left, what did she do? She went and got Jacob, and she arranged things to be settled in her own way. Now, I don't think, uh, I believe absolutely that somehow or another, Jacob would have received that blessing. I don't think that, uh, I've heard people say that, uh, you know, Rebecca was just doing what God said and therefore she's innocent. I don't think that's the case at all. I think she preferred Jacob and she wanted him to have the blessing. But regardless, guess who got blessed? Jacob. Okay. Um, I think the contention there between the brothers uh, was probably fed because uh, Isaac seemed to favor Esau and Rebekah seemed to favor Jacob. Now, uh, what happens when Esau finds out? <laughs> he, he was a little ticked. You know, when the days of mourning are over, I'm going to ask my brother to go out the field with me. <laughs> okay? If you have a sibling that asks you to go out the field with them, be prepared. Okay? Uh, so, I'm just going to hit a couple more real quick. Real quick. Next week we'll move in a little bit more uh, to some of the scriptures that talk about God's intent. Uh, we know the story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel and Bilhah and Zilpah and, and the, the, wow, that family tree has a lot of convoluted branches, okay? Um, but you have the ten brothers that decide, you know what, we don't like this one. Uh, one of the things that I actually saw uh, that I guess I wasn't really paying attention when I read before um, is that when they decided to get rid of Joseph, uh, he actually had pinked on them. He ratted out some of his brothers and, and told his dad, hey, they're not doing a very good job looking after the sheep. And, I, and that was part of what, what their motivation was. Now, Reuben, I, I, I wonder about Reuben. I can't quite figure the guy out because he says, oh, wait, let's not kill him. Let's stick him in here. And then he was going to sneak back later and, and get him out. My family was much more blunt than that. Um, there, there wasn't a lot of, uh, of uh, deception, I think. Um, if one of my brothers said to do something and I thought it was stupid, I would let him know I thought it was stupid. Uh, and, and the reverse would be true as well. Uh, but we see that God took that and he turned it to fulfill his purposes. Uh, again, indication we see pretty up front that Jacob loved Joseph more than his brothers. That's, that's a hard thing. That is a hard thing. Okay? Especially when the favoritism is so overt. Okay? Um, so, uh, was that Jacob's fault? 
or was it the brother's fault? I think they worked together to create a bad situation that God made good. Eli, anybody remember Eli? Bruce? Yeah, he was a priest. He's the one that sat on a, a rock outside of Shiloh, uh, where the tabernacle was. Uh, and he saw uh, Hannah praying, and he thought she was drunk. Okay, now, uh, Eli had uh, some children. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 2, um, let's turn there real quick. Real quick. So down in verse 12, um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, does anybody have a, uh, one of those little uh, topical headings right before chapter or verse 12? The wicked sons of Eli. The sins of Eli's sons. The sins of Eli's sons. Mine says Eli's worthless sons. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, I'll, I'll leave this to you to read. Essentially, the priests, uh, when, when the sacrifices were offered, they would take a fork uh, and, and the, the meat would be in a pot boiling, and they'd take a fork and they'd stab it in there, and whatever they drew out was their portion to eat. Um, Eli's sons were not happy with this. I don't know that I blame them because boiled meat is not that appealing to me. Um, and they would go to the people bringing the sacrifices, and they'd say, uh, down in verse 16, he says, um, let, oh, I'm sorry, one verse back, uh, 15, he says, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, uh, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it to me now, and if not, I will take it away by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Okay. Now, Eli rebukes his sons, but they keep doing these things. And we find out actually a, a little bit later that it was at the, the sons uh, pushing that Israel took the, the Ark of the Covenant to fight the Philistines and then lost it. Okay. I, I don't know. I mean, the, the verses here seem to indicate that Eli uh, tried to correct them. Um, but they didn't turn out well. They didn't. Um, but there was a young man in the room that watched the goings on by the name of Samuel. And Samuel was the last of the prophets, the that, that, uh, judges, excuse me, the last of the judges. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, Samuel had sons very similar to Eli's, because you, you go back just a couple more chapters, uh, chapter 8, uh, I'll turn there real quick, I'll just read the passage to you. Um, when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Now, Samuel was used incredibly of God. I don't know if it was nurture or nature. I don't know. But I do know this. Uh, whereas Samuel was blessed of God, his sons were not. Okay. As a direct result of this, because of the sons, uh, we find out a couple verses later, the people of Israel say, okay, you know what, we're done with judges. This is not working out. Give us a king. Okay. Um, so, take away from today, I'm going to deal a little bit uh, with David next week, is that very godly parents can have very ungodly children. Okay. Very ungodly parents 
they can still have godly children. Mm -hmm. but it's a lot harder. Well, no. Because the Spirit of God can accomplish what the Spirit wills. So, parents and children, if you are looking at your kids and scratching your head and you're wondering why they are where they're at, what's going on in their lives, um, the first thing I, I want to encourage you with, uh, we all failed as parents somewhere or another. Every one of us. Okay? There is only one perfect father and we just don't match up. Now uh, you can sit and stew and be depressed because the enemy is very good at, at showing you all the things that you did wrong and, and making you feel like uh, you just failed it all together. Um, but there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You start from today, you can't affect anything that happened yesterday. You can't affect anything that happened this morning, but you can affect what happens this afternoon. Okay? You, you make that point and you move forward. Don't let the enemy keep you trapped. If you have sinned against your children, own up to it, go and make it right. Repent. In as much as it depends on you, be at peace. Okay? Um, children, since pretty sure every one of us in here was at one point a child, uh, You can only blame your parents for so long. <laughs> After a while, it's all on you. It's you got to take ownership. You may have had some lousy parents, but that doesn't mean you have to be a lousy person. Okay? So, my encouragement, I'm not good at encouragement. If, if my encouragement sounds like I'm slapping you up the head, I'm sorry. <laughs> my encouragement for you today is that what, regardless of what happened in the past, you can make a new future. You can make things different going from here out. Okay? Father, we thank you that we have a good Father that we can pattern ourselves after you. I ask, Father, that you would help us to be godly parents to our children, those that are in the home, those that are grown. Father, help us from this point forward to be godly parents and godly grandparents and godly great-grandparents. Father, that, that your light would shine through us, that all of our, our children and grandchildren uh, would know the love of God because of what you've done for us. And I pray, Father, for those parents that are stuck, stuck in the lie. They may not have been the best parents, but Father, there is forgiveness, there is cleansing in the blood. Help us, Father, to have courage to make things right where they need to be made right. Help us, Father, to have courage of letting go of those things that need to be let go. And help us, Father, to truly reflect you first and foremost to our families. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.